Hello everyone, Biochemistry Web Channel is here with a new content within the scope of Biochemistry 1 course. I'm here with the subject of Biophysical Chemistry 2. I wish it to be useful to all biochemistry lovers. Let's start. The contents of this topic are first the solutions, which we will discuss solubility dispersed systems, protective colloids, the mole number, then we will look to concentration units such as molarity, molality, etc. And then the pH, amphoteric electrolytes, and finally the buffers we are our topic today. Let's start with the solutions. Solubility or solvation. Solubility is the amount of solute that dissolves in a given amount of solvent, usually reported in grams of solute per 100 milliliter of solution. Also, this is the measurement unit, gram per 100 milliliter or gram per deciliter. A solution that has less than the maximum number of grams of solute is said to be unsaturated. A solution that has the maximum number of grams of solute that can dissolve is said to be saturated. If we added more solute to a saturated solution, the additional solute would remain undissolved in the flask. And supersaturation is a state of a solution that contains more of the dissolved material than could be dissolved by the solvent under normal circumstances. Thus, according to the solubility of the solute, we can prepare unsaturated solutions that contain less solute than the amount it can dissolve at a given temperature. We can prepare saturated solutions that cannot dissolve more substances in it, and also supersaturated solutions that contain more solutes than they can dissolve. And also here you see the unsaturated solution which is a solution that has a chemical features which the solute concentration is lower than its equilibrium solubility. In the saturated solution, which is a chemical solution containing the maximum concentration of a solute dissolving the solvent. And in supersaturated solution, a supersaturated solution is a solution with more dissolved solute than the solvent would normally dissolve in its current conditions. And supersaturation is achieved by dissolving a solute in one set of conditions, then transferring it to the other conditions without triggering any release of the solute. And sprite solutions are extremely unstable. And so this is the precipitate that we can observe the precipitate at the bottom of the container. According to the amount of solute, we can classify solutions as the concentrated or dense solution. And this, these type of solutions contain a large amount of solute per liter of solution. And the second type is the dilute solution, contains a small amount of solute per liter of solution. And here you see the concentration solutions, and it's how the, the notice how dark the solution appears here. And there are lots of solute in a small amount of solvent. In the dilute solution, notice how light the solution appears, and small amount of solute in a large amount of solvent. And the blue ones are the solid particles, and the purple ones are the solvent particles. So to prepare solutions, we have to use solvents and there are two types of solvents which the one is polar solvents and the second one is the apolar solvents. The most ionic and polar covalent compounds are soluble in water which is the best or powerful polar solvent. Nonpolar compounds dissolve in nonpolar solvents such as carbon tetrachloride. Water soluble compounds are ionic or are small polar molecules that can form hydrogen bonds with the water solvent. And the good example is 
solid sodium chloride is held together by very strong electrostatic interactions of oppositely charged ions. You may check organic chemistry lecture notes about the ionic bondings and the covalent bondings and I strongly suggest you if you don't remember. When mixed with water, the sodium cation and chlorine anions are separated and surrounded by the polar water molecules. The, but the hydrophobic substances such as hydrocarbons, alkanes for example, dissolve in an, in an apolar solvent such as carbon tetrachloride or benzoyl. Since such substances dissolve very well in fats, they are also called lipophilic substances. In this picture, the solution of sodium chloride in water is depicted. And when ionic sodium chloride, as you see, which are the ionic crystals here, or the solid crystals, when we dissolve in water, the crystalline sodium and chloride interactions are replaced by new interactions of sodium here and the chlorine ions with the solvent with the water each ion is surrounded by a loose shell of water molecules arranged so that the oppositely charged pieces are close together and the hydrogen the partially positive part side of the water interact with the chlorine anion and the oxygen part of the water molecule which carry negative charges or free lone pairs interact with the cation sodium and it will be a salty water. A dispersion is a system in which distributed particles of one material are dispersed in a continuous phase of another material. The two phases may be in the same or different states of matter. If one component is present in greater quantities than the other, this component is called the dispersion medium or the continuous phase. The one with fewer components is called the dispersed phase or discontinuous phase. And there are being more than one dispersed phase in a dispersion medium. And so a question is, what are the dispersed systems? And there are three dispersed systems which one the true solutions or shortly we can you can call them solutions. The second one is the collays, and the last one is the suspension. And these three solutions differ in terms of particle size, as you see here, which may be the biggest difference between these uh, dispersion systems, for example, to solution less than one nanometer, and collays between one to 100 nanometer, and the suspension larger than 100 nanometer. But also there are some other features such as the visibility, movement of particles, osmotic pressure, thin dust phenomena, and the passage of particles through a semi-permeable membrane. Homogeneous mixtures of two or more components are called the solutions or the true solutions. Any phase of matter can form a solution. So when the two substances form a solution, the substance present in the lesser amount is called the solute, this which is the discontinuous phase, and the substance present in the larger amount is the solvent. And the solution with water as the solvent is called an aqueous solution. And if one component is present in greater quantities than the other, this component is called solvent, and the lesser component is called solute. And there can be more than one solute in a solvent. And so those won't get this information. It's so important. This is why I repeated it. And the good table for you, which help uh, you to study the differences of the three solutions, collides and suspension. And I talk about the particle sizes, Look at the particle size. Three solutions are homogeneous, but colloids and suspensions are heterogeneous. Three solutions behave like the third unit other than the soluble and solvent. And remember always, always remember the uh, salt 
and water, when we mix them, we have a salty water. And salty water is a different character, has a different characteristic. Three solutions, they have low viscosity, but in color suspensions, higher viscosity. Even in suspensions, very high viscosity. In true solutions, they possess osmotic pressure, but in colloids, it's love, and suspensions do not show osmotic pressure. When the lead passes, the true solutions are eliminated, but in colloids, they get foggy, which is called Tyndall effect. In true solutions, particles cannot be even cannot be seen even with the most powerful optical and electronic systems, but in cold layers, particles can be seen with an electron microscope. And in suspensions, even with the eye, we can observe the particles. In three solutions, particles make molecular movements. In cold layers, Brownian motion is seen in particles. In suspensions, slow Brownian motion is seen in the particles. And the last feature is, what about the filtration? In true solutions, filtering the particles through the filter paper is not possible, even in dialysis. And in colloids, the particles are separated by filtration through filter paper and also can be separated by dialysis. In suspensions, a simple filter paper uh, is enough to separate these particles, even we can use dialysis. And also, I want you to pay attention to the colloid, the features of colloid, one of the features of colloids, which is heterogeneous mixtures. Actually, the colloids are heterogeneous mixtures in which particles of an insoluble substance are suspended along another substance. The composition of the components is not the same throughout the solution. A colloidal solution, often described as a colloidal suspension, which is a mixture in which substances are usually suspended in a liquid. A colloid is very small material, usually diffused from another substance, and they are actually heterogeneous in nature, but appear to be homogeneous. These solutions can produce the Tyndall effect and are actually very stable in nature. Colloidal solutions are usually composed of the following three basic components, a dispersed phase, which is called the discontinuous or internal phase, which consists of very discrete particles of large ordinary molecules, and a dispersion medium, the medium in which the dispersed phase exists. It consists of continuously interlocked molecules and also stabilizing, stabilizing agents. And this is a substance used to keep the collate particles apart. And self collates are self stabilizing. Collates appear homogeneous because the particles of a collate are spread quite uniformly throughout the solution. The mixture appears homogeneous because of the relatively small size of particles compared to the suspension. Due to smaller size of collate particles, it is difficult to see them with the naked eye. Thus, colloidal substances are not homogeneous in nature. And here you see three different dispersed phases, and here the solution, a homogeneous mixture that appears clear like the salt water in this aquarium. And here you see a photo of an aquarium containing fish, and the particle diagram below it shows 90 here, in 90 small red spheres. And here you see the colloids, such as milk. The particles are much larger, look at here, but remains dispersed and did not settle. And here you see a photograph of milk put into a glass. And the corresponding particle diagram shows about 25 medium sized red spheres. And here, a suspension like mud is a heterogeneous mixture of suspended particles that looks cloudy and particles can settle. And here, the diagram or a photograph of two pairs of feet wearing sandals in mud shove, and the particle diagram below shows 10 fairly large red spheres.
The Tyndall effect is seen in this diagram, and it is the scattering of light by particles in a very fine suspension and collate. The particles in a collate are large enough to scatter light. And here you see we have a three dispersed system, the solution, the collate, and the suspension. And the light beam is not visible in solution, but visible in collate and suspension. And examples, water, milk, and fluorant water. So, what is the phenomenon of Tyndall effect? Particles in collate are large enough to scatter light, a phenomenon called the Tyndall effect. It can make collate a mixture such as beams from a searchlight, a pair cloudy, or opaque. Shining of a flashlight beam into a glass of milk is an excellent demonstration of the Tyndall effect. You may want to use skim milk or dilute the milk with a little water so you can see the effect of colored particles on the light beam. The visible beam of the headlights in fog is caused by the Tyndall effect. Water droplets scatter light, making headlight beams visible. The Tyndall effect is used in commercial and laboratory settings to determine the particle size of aerosols. And the clothes are colored on mixtures too. They are made of made up of water droplets that are much larger than molecules but too small to collapse. Let's look at the, some important terms of the colloidal state. The space phase colloidal solution is given to the particles of solute in the solution. The space medium is the solvent in a colloidal solution. And suspensoid or the lyophobic system or lyophobic collates and collate particles do not have affinity to the molecules of solvent, and most the complexes of inorganic particles which do not have affinity to the solvent. And in this type of colloidal system, the dispersed phase does not have an affinity for the dispersion medium, so the colloid is not readily formed and unstable, easily coagulated. Examples of lymphobic colloids are metals and their insoluble compounds such as sulfides. And in the case of suspensoid, the dispersion medium is called the hydrophobic. What about emulsoids or the lymphophilic system? A mixture of two or more immiscible liquids, one liquid, the dispersed phase, is dispersed in the other, the continuous phase. And the lymphophilic colloids in this type of colloidal system the dispersed phase has a high affinity for the dispersion medium. They have the ability to protect, to protect lipophobic collates from electrolytes. They form a protective layer around lipophobic particles. And the examples of lipophobic collates are the gelatin, gum, starch, protein, rubber, etc. That's their hydrophilic, in the, which means the dispersion medium is, wat in, is water and in emulsified, such a system called hydrophilic. Viscosity states of the emissions, which there are two solent gel in the salt gel, the viscosity is love, close to the true solution, and it's called a cold system that can flow from one vessel to another. In the gel form, viscosity increases, taking a jelly like shape. It is called collates, which must be pressurized to provide the fluidity. And a good example is collagen. Or for the soul, the good example is the printer ink. An aqueous solution that contains ions conducts electricity, whereas one that contains only neutral molecules does not. And the substance that conduct, conducts an electric current in water is called electrolyte. A substance that does not conduct an electric current in water is called non-electrolyte. And a good example for an electrolyte, sodium chloride, and for the non-chloride, hydrogen peroxide, or maybe the glucose. In acute solutions prepared with ionic substances such as acids, bases, and salts, which they conduct electric current.
Let's continue on this figure, which the, uh, the figure represents the type of solutions, whether they are electrolyte or non-electrolyte. And here you see a non-electrolyte solution, which we switch on the, the plug. There is no electric conduction, thus the light bulb is on off position. And the good example is the ethanol, distilled water, or the hydrogen peroxide. And here in this in this representation, you see the, the the plug switch on and the light is in on position. This means the electric current is conducted. And here you see the ionized particles. And the good example is sodium chloride. And here also there is an electric conductance, but conductivity but the power of conductivity is lesser than this solution. And a good example is acetic acid. So there are strong electrolytes such as sodium chloride and also weak electrolytes such as acetic acid and also organic acids. And for a substance to conduct electric current, there must be free electrons. Anions and cations must be present in the solution. And compounds do not conduct electricity in solid state, in liquid form, and in solutions, ionic compounds conduct electric current. And as the number of ions in a solution increases, or as the temperature increases, the conductivity of the solution increases. The electrical conductivity of metals is due to the flow of electrons, translational motion, and the phenomena is physical, but here it is chemical. In an aqueous solution, the compounds, uh, the conductivity of aqueous solutions of compounds are, is chemical. And solutions of substances that dissolve in water as a molecular network do not conduct electric current. Protective colloids. Emulsoids are much more durable than suspensoids. If a small amount of an emulsoid is added to the suspension, the suspension is more stable. And the emulsoid forms a protective layer around the suspended particles and gives the emulsoid most of its own strength. The emulsions used in this way are called protective collates. And except for globulins, various proteins have protective effects. Many water-insoluble substances in blood plasma can be transported without collapse by the protective colloids in the plasma, and lipids dissolve as colloids under the influence of proteins. Insoluble substances such as calcium phosphate and uric acid are brought to the excretion door by the action of protective colloids in the urine without causing undue and oversaturated solubilizing. It has been reported that the reduction of the protective collates contained in the urine may make urinary stones, erythritis, possible. And urine is a supersaturated solution and has a very complex composition. It contains both electrolytes and non-electrolytes in a higher concentration than their solubility in water. The urine of a healthy person contains collates such as mucopolysaccharides or glycosaminoglycans that prevent precipitation of substances in such saturated solution. And it is the protective effect of these collates that is important in preventing precipitation, agglomeration, and conglomeration of the crystalloids. Conglomeration of crystalloids. However, if the concentration of such protective collates is insufficient, then the crystal nucleus becomes sensitized and storm formation begins or accelerates. It's time to set out concentration units or units of concentration. And let's start with the mole number, which equals to 6.02 times 10 to 23 numbers of particles, which we call it the Avogadro number, and Italian scientists, Amedeo Avogadro revealed that number. But to make it easy to measure of the one mole, we weight 
the atomic mass in grams so one mole of an element equals to its atomic mass and if we talk about the uh, molecule about the one mole of a molecule we win the molecular mass so for a given molecule its molecular mass equals one mole and for example one mole of iron we need to weigh 656 grams iron for one mole of aluminium when we have to weigh 27 grams of aluminium and to find the atomic mass of each element we will, we should check the periodic table and look at oxygen here such as 16 so one mole of oxygen equals 16 grams and three moles means 48 grams of oxygen and for calcium about 40 which five moles means 200 grams of calcium and for the carbon here for example 0 0.5 moles of carbon means six grams of carbon let's study some problems and the first problem is solved by me for the rest you will study how much grams should we weigh to prepare two moles of sodium hydroxide and this is a molecule thus we have to calculate the molecular mass and to do it we have to we have to uh, get the sum of the molecular atomic mass of sodium oxygen and hydrogen and easily it will be 40 grams per mole so for one mole of sodium hydroxide we have to weigh 40 gram and two mole does the 80 grams the answer is 80 grams and for the rest of the questions please pause the video at the point and try to solve them and put your results on the comments and after the mole number it's time to talk about the concentrations concentration units such as the, the first one is the molarity the molar concentration which is the most common measure of concentration in the laboratory and the, the, what is the definition of molarity the number of moles of solute per liter of solution so the molarity of which the symbol is big m or mole per liter as defined as the number of moles of solute this is solute per liter of solution per liter of solution so solute in moles and solution in liter and be careful i said the solution not the solvent so this is so important preparing molar concentration from solid chemicals this is the easiest way because to prepare molar concentration you will uh, do calculations to find the mole number and the volume you require to calculate the molarity and for example look, let's look at the sodium hydroxide which is a solid chemical the molecular weight is 40 gram per mole so in for the sodium hydroxide if we take is one mole which is 40 gram and prepare a one liter solution thus we prepare this means we prepare one mole of sodium hydroxide if two mole 80 or 0.5 mole 20 gram and also we can change the volume of solution but don't forget it must be liter so such as if you want to prepare uh, maybe only 100 milliliter of solution thus in the to, to, to put this number in the equation we have to convert 100 milliliter to liter which makes 0 0.1 later so this is so important during the calculations so preparing molar concentrations from acids we have uh, additional calculations such such look uh, such substances because the acids are liquid in nature this means they are already a solution thus they have a molar concentration so in this type of uh, in calculation of this type of solutions we have two steps which the, the first step is to find the molar concentration of our stock solution 
and the second step will be deletion of our stock solution to prepare the required solution and to calculate the molar concentration of a stock solution we have obtained three important data which the one is the molecular weight of the acid such as sulfuric acid 98 gram per mole the density of the acid and the percentage of the acid and the density represents uh, or represents that the the given solution in or each milliliter of this solution contains 1.84 grams of solute and this percentage tells us how many percents of this solute is sulfuric acid this means 98% of 1.84 grams of solute is sulfuric acid so by using these data we can calculate the molar concentration of our acid our stock acid and here the formula that we can also use but instead of formula I suggest to learn the the calculation methodology or the logic of calculation and here the first thing that you should do but before calculating let me erase this ones that's okay and so we, we will start with the density so as you see here it is given a milliliter so I have I, I want to change this and I suggest at that level to convert milliliter to liter and so the question is 1.84 grams per milliliter equals to how many grams per liter and the answer is 1830 grams of liter by converting density to liter the, the milliliter to liter so that, thus we obtain the volume of our solution the volume of our solution and I know at the second step, I know only to third each 100 unit of this solution carry 98% of our solute. Thus, 1,830 grams will be what? We have the X number here, which will be 1,840 1, times 98 per 1. And let me brief time to calculate it. And the answer is one thousand eight hundred three decimal blah blah, but we cannot meet three. So now we have revealed the solute amount of sulfuric acid in our solution in, in one liter of solution don't forget it one liter of solution so this means each one liter of our stock solution contains 1803 grams of sulfuric acid so at the third step by using its molecular mass we know each 98 gram is one mole thus 1803 will be how many moles how many moles let me to calculate how many moles so the answer is 18.4 18.4 moles now we are ready to put this to the formula so let me erase here okay for our stock solution for our sulfuric acid solution I said the big M is equal to mole per liter we have one liter which is obtained by converting density to liter and we have the mole number here 18 decimal 4 thus which makes our solution 18.4 molar concentration or mole per 
later. Now we have the molarity. And at the second step, I set the deletion. So if, what about if I want to prepare one molar concentration in a one liter solution? That's, this time I have to use a formula C1, V1 to C2, V2. Because the deletion means in, by increasing the uh, amount of solvent, we will, we will decrease the concentration of solute in a given solution in a volume. So C1 here is the 18.4 times V1 and C2 1 times 1. And another critical point is here, the volumes and the concentration must be in same unit. If I wrote here the big M, thus C2 must be big M. If I write the V2 here, the 1 liter, so V2 will be in liter when we calculate. And the V2 is here. 1.184. So let me calculate. And the answer is 0. Point, answer is 0 0.05. So this means I will get 0 0.05 volume from our stock solution and then fill up to one liter to prepare one molar concentration. The second unit is the molality or the molar solutions. A molar solution is a solution that contains one molecular weight, which means the mole number of solute in a kilogram of solvent. And here there is an important difference when comparing to the molarity, LR. In molarity, one liter of solution. But in here, a kilogram of solvent, one kilogram of solvent. Now we have the solvent in this concentration unit. And it's small m or mole per kilogram. Preparing molar concentration for some common cause, it is almost similar to the preparing molar concentration from solid chemicals in molarity. But here we have the formula, sorry, small m equals small per kilogram. So here the solvent is 500 grams. We must put here in kilogram, thus 0 0.5 kilogram. And the 10 gram calculate this mole number and we know each one mole we have to wait 40 gram that's for 10 mole 1.4 which is 0 0.25 so the 0 0.25 0 0.25 divided 0 0.5 and the answer will be 0 0.5 small m or mole per kilogram and don't miss the difference between the molarity and the molality here the, the numerators are same but the denominators are different here are the solution the volume of solution and here the mass of solvent and, and here there are questions for you so at that point, pause the video and try to solve these questions and put your answers on the comments. And continue the second page after solving the questions in first the slide before, then the previous slide, then continue this slide. Pause and try to solve them. And osmol unit. One osmol of a substance equals to its molecular mass divided osmotically active particle number. Sodium chloride dissociates to sodium and chloride ions in aqueous solution, since each molecule forms two osmotically active particles. Thus, one osmol grams of sodium chloride is 
58.5 divided 2 which makes 29.25 grams so to prepare one osmolar solution of sodium chloride we should weigh 29.25 grams of sodium chloride but for glucose for example which is dissolved in molecular state or molecular networks one osmolar glucose is 180 grams and this means a compound solved in the molecular state or which given one active particle their osmolar and the mole number are same that's also the molar concentrations and osmolar concentrations will be same so the, the determinator of this feature is whether the compound is ionic or non-ionic osmolarity or osmotic concentration it is the measure of solid concentration defined as the number of osmoles of solute per liter of solution. Thus, the, the common symbol is osmol per liter. Osmolarity can be used to predict whether water will pass from one side of a semipermeable membrane to the other, also referred to as water retention. So how much gram should we wait to prepare T or small of 4 liter sodium chloride solution? So try to solve this problem according to the given knowledge to you. So how much gram should we wait to prepare T osmolar concentration or osmotic concentration of 4 liter of sodium chloride? And here is the hint. This is also the formula which if you if you weigh one osmol of a chemical and prepare its one liter solution, it will be one osmotic concentration. And what about sodium chloride? So the critical thing is to determine whether it's an ionic or non-ionic. And if it's ionic, how many particles will be released when dissolved in water? And the answer is two for sodium chloride. And plasma osmolarity, which we can calculate using sodium, glucose, and urea. Osmolality, as seen in molarity, molarity comparison, we have also osmolarity and the osmolality, which is the number of osmoles of solute in a kilogram of solvent, similar to molarity. Thus, here we have a kilogram of solvent. And here's the difference between osmolarity, the osmolarity and the difference in the denominator, which osmolarity is the volume of solution, one liter of solution containing one osmol of a matter, and in osmolarity, one osmol of matter plus one kilogram of solvent. So the measured osmolality, so we can measure osmolality in the lab, it can be measured using osmometer, and it works on it works on the method of depression of freezing point. And what is the difference between osmolarity and osmolality? Osmolarity, osmolarity as in the as in the volume, as in volume, given in volume, I look at here the liter of solution. And it is affected by changes in water content, as well as the temperature and pressure. In contrast, osmolality is independent of temperature and pressure for a given solution osmolarity is slightly less than osmolality because the total solvent weight excludes the weight of an weight of any solute whereas the total solution volume which is used for osmolarity includes solute content otherwise one liter of plasma would be equivalent to one kilogram of plasma and plasma osmolarity and plasma osmolality would be equal. However, at low concentrations, such as below about 500 millimolarity, millimol uh, per liter, the mass of the solute is negligible compared to the mass of the solvent. And osmolarity and osmolality are very similar. And technically, the terms can be compared as follows. For the osmolality, it is measured in laps using osmometer, in milliosmol per kilogram and for the osmolarity it's a it is calculated using a formula or using the data from 
data or the concentration of sodium glucose and the urea and concentration unit is milliosmol per liter and in practice there is almost negligible difference as i said between the absolute values of the, these two different uh, measurements this is why both terms are often used interchangeably and even though they refer to the different units of measurement and normal human such as uh, as an example normal human reference range of osmolality in plasma is about 275 to 299 milliosmoles per kilogram equivalent concentration or the normality the normality is another way of expression expressing the concentration of a solution it is based on an alternate chemical unit of mass called the equivalent weight it is also called the equivalent ground the normality of a solution is the concentration expressed as the number of equivalent weights of solute per liter of solution and the equivalent concentration of norm or normality of a solution is defined as the molar concentration divided by an equivalence factor normality is mostly used for acids and bases if acids and bases if the same normality are mixed they neutralize each other and this can be used to calculate the normality factor which tells us how normal it really is equilibrated grams are found by dividing the molecular weight of the substances to be prepared by the solubility value using the valency of the substance to be prepared a normal solution contains one equivalent of solute per liter of solution and for acid base reactions an equivalent is the amount of a reactant that can produce or consume one mole of hydrogen ions using branchland levry definition so for example one mole of hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide is one equivalent but one mole of sulfuric acid or calcium dihydroxide is two equivalents and here is the formula of normality which equals equivalent grams of the solute per liter of solution or the volume of solution and sometimes also or <clears throat> not sometimes instead of using equivalent grams of the solute we can also use the valence number which is almost similar with the one mole of a matter and we know the one mole equals the molecular weight one mole of an acid or base equals to its molecular weight divided by the by the valence of acid or base or how many hydrogens or hydroxyl present in the acid or bases and thus we have the symbols big n equivalence per liter or valence per liter to prepare normal solution for chemical chemicals solid chemicals are almost same with the uh, to, uh, same to pre same with preparing molar solutions and as seen here we have the example sodium hydroxide if an acid or base has one valence or the equivalence factor it's normal and molar concentration is almost same if the valence number is two or more then it will change uh, the normal concentration and preparing normal solution from acids are almost similar to the so, so to prepare solutions molar solutions or molar concentration using acids and in, in, in the formula there is an, uh, an additional factor in the formula which is the equivalence factor and also in shortly the normality of a solution equals to its molarity times its equivalence factor equivalence factor and there are two questions for you so it's time to pause the video and try to solve them and put the answers on the comments percentage solutions 
percentage solution is an amount or volume of chemical or compound per 100 milliliter of a solution. In other words, percentage concentration is a measure of how much solute is dissolved in every 100 units of solution, or 100 milliliter of solutions carrying the desired percentage of grams, and it's a relative expression of solute solvent. So x amount per 100 milliliter equals x percent. And there are three type of percentage solution. Which one is the weight volume? And this is the common one. And an example: 250 milliliters and 10 percent sodium hydroxide solution to prepare this solution. So let's focus on the 10 percent, which means 10 grams in 100 milliliter of solution. So this is volume of solution, not the volume of solvent. If you want to prepare 250, thus multiply both sides 2.5, which makes 25 gram in 250 milliliter. This will give us 10% of sodium hydroxide solution. And the second one is volume volume, which is actually a kind of Deletion, it's a deletion that we will use C1, V1 equals to C2, V2, and try this uh, solution, try to solve this problem. The preparation of 100 milliliter of ethyl alcohol of 10 40% by using 96% ethyl alcohol. This is our stock solution. This is the C1, this is C2, and this is V2. Thus, we need to calculate V1. Let's do it. Pause the video and do it. And the last minimum weight weight as seen in the molality, molality as we see in molality, now the the mass of solvent is important in this percentage solution. So to prepare five percent of sodium hydroxide according to the weight per weight solution. We will weight 5 grams of sodium hydroxide plus 95 grams of water. And by the way, my friends, the unit of the operation of the gram is only small letter G, not the GR. This is incorrect. This is this is incorrect. This is ridiculous. Dilution. Dilution is the process of decreasing the concentration of a solute in a solution usually simply by mixing with more solvent like adding more water to a solution to delete a solution means to add more solvent without the addition of more solute there is no addition of solute this is so critical it is usually prepared from stock solutions of known concentration as we as we can uh, do it in in preparing acidic solutions or in percentage volume volume type of solutions they are kind of deletions and here the formulas which this is the common c represents this n represents the number volume mass volume and c represents concentration and volume and here there are three questions that solve the first one together so what is the normality when 400 milliliter of water is added to 100 milliliter of 0.5 normal sulfuric acid? So we have the V1, C1. So 0.5 times 100 milliliters, 0.5 normal, equals to C2 times... 400 milliliter is it true no be careful v2 is the volume of diluted solution and here this is the added water to 100 which makes the v2 500 milliliter 500 milliliter so when we do the calculation give me a second which means 0 0.5 times 100 divide 500 which the c2 is 0.1 normal or valence per liter so don't forget to put the measurement units otherwise the loan numbers does not have any meaning 
So this is so important. So for the rest, pause the video and try yourself. And the last slide for the solutions, PPM and the PPB. The PPM represents pass per million. One PPM is equivalent to one milligram of something per liter of water or one milligram of something per kilogram soil. That's one PPM means one milligram per liter or one milligram per kilogram. And for PPB, Pass per billion is the number of units of mass over contaminant per 1,000 million units of total mass. And it's the, it means the PPB equals microgram per liter or microgram per kilogram. It's time for the second title of this topic, pH, amphoteric electrolytes and Office. And the pH scale. Knowing the hydronium ion concentration is necessary in many different instances. The blood must have a hydronium concentration in a very narrow range for an individual's good health. Since values for the hydronium ion concentration are very small with negative powers of 10, the pH scale is used to more conveniently report hydronium ion concentration. And here the P of pH, the P of pH refers power of hydrogen or potential or percent. Actually, there is no definite definition of what P refers. And the pH scale was devised by the Danish chemist Soren Peder Lewis Sorensen at the Carlsberg Laboratory in 1909 and later modified to its modern form in 1924, as summarized by materials today. And as that publication notes, what the P stands for depends on who you ask. The Carlsberg Foundation itself says the pH means power of hydrogen. However, German chemists claim it stands for the potence, also meaning power, whereas the French say it is their word of power, puissance. Ancient Romans would have it that it's a Latin phrase, pondus hydrogeni, meaning quantity of hydrogen, or perhaps potentia hydrogeni, capacity of hydrogen. The Brits would say it's nothing more complicated than potential hydrogen. Another theory is that the P is short for log because the pH scale is logarithmic and inversely indicates the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. So sometimes it is said that it's a hydrogen ion concentration, but in real it is hydronium ion concentration, or shortly we can say for the pH, you know me the negative powers of 10 of the hydrogen ion concentrations, but I am actually the hydronium ion concentration. So after this brief information about the P, let's continue. And the pH of a solution is number generally between 0 and 14, defined in terms of the logarithm of the hydronium ion concentration. Although we focus on plasma pH, intracellular pH is critical for cell viability, normal enzyme function and other metabolic process. Thus, the pH scale of both extracellular and intracellular area, thus the acid-base balance, is maintained by the highly harmonized functioning of the liver, lungs and kidneys and as well as the chemical buffers. The hydrogen ion produced in the organism must be balanced by its excretion. And we did the definition of pH, I said the negative logarithm of the concentration of hydronium ions present in a solution. And the solution is an acid if its pH is less than 7, a base if it is greater than 7, and neutral if it is 7. And plasma hydrogen ion concentration 
or hydronium ion concentration we mean i mean both are same is kept within normal within very narrow limits in a way that no other ion is and for that cells have defense mechanism organism has defense mechanism against the pa changes especially in the extracellular environment because we know the marginal pa alterations in the extracellular environment can affect the integrity of the intracellular environment too thus causing disruption in metabolism and even causing cell death and here you see some body fluids and their ph values and look at the value of the blood plasma 7338 to 7344 so very narrow range and in some uh, lecture notes also it is written as 735 to 45 and there may be a slight differences between species and also the other body fluids such as milk 66 to 69 and urine a wide range for eight to seven five it all it de also depends on the uh, the content of the food sources the hydrogen and concentration balance in other words acid base balance and the amount of hydrogen taken in the diet plus endogenous metabolism is preserved as a result of mutual balancing of the amount obtained and the amount taken from the body thus the balance of extracellular fluid is kept within the physiological limits and viability is maintained to ensure the equilibrium volatile acids are removed by respiration such as carbon dioxide hydrogen and bicarb are removed or retained by the kidneys and it form complex with non-volatile hydrogen chemical buffers and is discarded so volatile acid production occurs in mitochondria or the mitochondrial events or mitochondrial reactions produce volatile acids such as the oxidation of carbohydrates to carbon dioxide and water and the better oxidation of fatty acids again the carbon dioxide and water non-volatile acid production again produced by the oxidation of carbohydrates such as lactic acid beta oxidation of fatty acids such as ketone bodies and the oxidation of amino acids and the oxidation of nucleic acids high acid load is seen in animals grown in grasslands with high sulfate and phosphate residues of fat with high amount of grain feed however normal endogenous acid production may increase in some pathological conditions and the best example of this is the increase in ketone body synthesis seen in diabetes mellitus that's also we call it the diabetic ketoacidosis and organic acid formation may also increase due to toxins or drugs such as formic acid from methanol glycolic and oxalic acid from ethyl and glycol anti salicylic acid from aspirin The fruits are an alkali source, contains sodium and potassium salts of weak organic acids. Their dissociated ions become hydrogen acceptors before metabolism. And alkalose is, as we this, this I will this define later slides, appears to be due to abundance of sodium bicarb or other alkali salts in animals, but it is more likely due to the acid loss, such as loss of gastric acid because of vomiting. So, for non-volatile acids, body hydrogen input sources are the diet, metabolism, and fecal base loss, and body hydrogen output sources, urine. And in a dog, an average hydrogen input amount is 1.0 millimole per day per kilogram live weight, while the corresponding amount is extracted from the kidneys. An average 10 millimol per day per kilogram live weight, bicarb, and base equivalents extracted in the body mainly by feces while the corresponding hydrogen amount is retained in the extracellular fluid so continue on the measurement of ph because as we define the ph is so important for the cellular functions 
So in an organism to evaluate the pH, thus to evaluate the acid base balance, we need to use some techniques to measure pH. And there are two techniques, which the one is the electrometric methods based on the fact that the potential difference between the two electrodes is measured by a galvanometer. And this is the precise and accurate measurement technique, because in this technique, we can get the decimal numbers or the exact uh, value or the concentration of the hydrogen and concentration. And the second method is the calorimetric, which is based on the principle of color change at certain pH values of some dyes. And the substances use color changes according to the hydrogen and concentration of the medium. We call them the indicators, or shortly pH indicators. And indicators are usually weak acids and bases. And here you see a pH meter, which is based on the electrometric or potential metric uh, method and as you see in the picture the pH is seen as 7.58 and remember the blood plasma value we have to read the digits after decimal at least two digits because the range is 7 decimal 83 or 7.83 38 sorry 38 to 7.44 so we have to read these digits An indicator is a halochromic chemical compound added in small amounts to a solution. So the pH, acidity or basicity of the solution can be determined visually. And such solutions are used to determine the endpoint of the titration. Also, we use them in a titrometric analytical techniques. We can separate indicators as acid base, redox and precipitation indicators. The point where the indicator changes color is called the turning point. And indicators are usually weak acids and bases. They do not give a definite result, they give approximate results. To get the definite results, we have to use electrometric methods. And here in this table, you see some uh, indicators, the pH limits and the color change. And also, uh, nowadays, uh, a common test techniques uh, or the common uh, pH measurement technique based on indicators are used, such as the pH test papers here, as you see, which have the indicator, you put the test paper or the test strip into the solution and wait for a while and then remove it and then wait for a while again and observe the column change and also compare the column change against the against the label or the given color changes on the test tube or maybe in the instructions. And then we try to find the best color change matched with the colors in the instruction paper. And then we decide what is the pH of the solution. And as you see, we can only say such as 6, pH 6 or maybe 7. No precise, accurate or no result after dots or point. We can just say absolute numbers. And also a, a famous one here, as you see the litmus paper. By using litmus paper, we just say the solution is a base or an acid. No value is given. Yeah, there are some important definitions, uh, usually uh, confusing or used interchangeably, but actually they are different things. So acidemia, and look at the word, the amia represents a state in blood. Acidemia is the state of love blood pH. And acidosis, which means osis, metabolic events occurring, is the process leading to the state of acidemia. 
alkalemia alkalemia is the state of abnormally high blood pH and alkalosis is a process characterized by the buildup or accumulation of excess base or alkali in the body. pH is important for the body because it plays a critical role in maintaining the proper functioning of various physiological processes. So any deviations in pH scale affects the enzyme activity, which enzymes are biological catalysts and we need them and the cells require the enzymes for the continuity of the metabolic events. And many enzymes are sensitive to changes in pH because they are optimized within the specific pH range. So, so to maintain the correct pH levels, ensure the enzyme activity. Changes in pH scale also affect the protein structure. And proteins, a fundamental structural components of cells and also organism, are sensitive to pH changes. And the, the pH levels, deviations in pH levels, can disrupt the protein structure, thus the function. And blood pH regulation is also important. And the blood pH is tightly regulated because even slight deviations from the normal range can have serious health consequences. An acid-base balance, maintaining the right acid-base balance in the body is crucial for the overall health. It will affect the enzyme activity, protein structure, and the blood pH, and the cellular functions. The pH within individual cells must also be maintained with a specific range to support the various cellular processes, including energy production, DNA replication, and also the functioning of the cell membranes. So the deviations from the optimal pH can disrupt these processes. The immune system functions optimally with a certain pH range, so proper pH levels help immune cells function effectively in defending the body against infections and diseases. And also a similar thing in nervous system functions, so the pH levels can affect the function of nerve cells. Thus abnormal levels of pH can disrupt the nerve signaling and contribute to the neurological diseases. Maintaining the body's pH balance is also essential for preserving the bone health. And especially in chronic cases, uh, leaching of calcium from bones can happen, which potentially increases the risk of osteoporosis. In summary, pH is crucial for the body because it ensures the proper function of enzymes, proteins, cellular processes, as well as the overall health and balance of the body's system. And the body has complex mechanisms to regulate and maintain the pH within the required ranges to support these vital functions. And these are achieved by the buffers systems or this service is provided by some tissues organs and the chemical buffers which the chemical buffers the constituents of the chemical buffers are the amphoteric electrolytes this is why the next title is amphoteric electrolytes or amphoterism the ability of some chemicals to act either as an acid or a base is called amphoterism whether an amphoteric chemical acts as an acid or a base depends on what other chemicals happen to be around. And the amphoteric electrolytes uh, carry some specific features. They form cations in acidic medium and anions in alkaline environment. An amphalite carries the same number of negative and positive charges at a given pH. And this pH is called the isoelectric point 
and the isoelectric point is the pH at which a particular molecule carries no net electrical charge in the statistical mean. An ampholyte moves to cathode in acid reaction and moves to anode in alkaline reaction and does not move at isoelectric point. Ampholytes may bind both hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions according to the pH of the medium. Because of this, ampholytes act as a buffers against acid or against bases. And the point where the concentrations of hydrogen plus hydroxyl ions are equal to each other is called the neutral point. And the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxyl ions are inversely proportional to each other and equals the molar concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius and the solution is neutral. So the buffers are ampholytes. Let's define buffers. A buffer is a solution whose pH changes very little when acid or base is added. So the buffers can neutralize small amounts of added acid or base, thus keeping the pH of the solution relatively constant. And this is important for processes and or reactions that require specific and stable pH ranges. And also buffers are a kind of mixtures, mixtures containing equal amounts of a weak acid, which is a proton donor, and its conjugated base proton acceptor are known as buffer system and they are acute systems then tend to resist acute systems correction buffers are acute systems that tend to resist pH changes when small small amounts of acid or base are added and as I said they are solutions composed of equal amounts of weak acid weak acid and the salt of its conjugate base and the weak acid of the buffer reacts with the added base and the conjugate base of the buffer reacts with the acid and all reactions occurring in the organism within certain pH limits thus changes in pH prevent the reaction from occurring and when events occur in the organism that will cause the pH change the buffer, the buffer systems or the mechanisms similar to the buffer systems in the same laboratory conditions are activated to prevent the pH change in body. The normal blood pH of a healthy individual is in the range of 738 to 744 and a pH above or below this range is generally indicative of an imbalance in respiratory or metabolic processes. The body can maintain a very stable pH because blood and other tissues are buffered. This is only possible if the buffer systems in the body and certain prominent organ systems work together in harmony. So what are these systems and buffers? So lungs, that's respiration, kidneys, renal mechanism and the chemical buffers and then blood plasma in erythrocytes and also in other fluids such as lymph, serpreciprinal fluid and transudase, there are some buffers and to which the major ones are the bicarbonate, carbonic acid buffers, phosphate, phosphoric acid and the protein, protein at buffer systems. And also hemoglobin has buffering capacity in erythrocytes and also there are other types of uh, buffering system such as also amino acids such as uh, I said protein it they have buffering capacity and in general the naming the buffer system we use the conjugate base component of the buffer system because in general uh, the favorite processes in metabolism is acid load that's the the component the the conjugated the base component of that buffers, their concentrations are higher than the, the acid component of the system. 
This is why using bicarbonate and carbonic acid system, we just say the bicarb or the phosphate buffer system or the proteinate buffer system. Let's look at the, some features of three major buffers. The bicarb buffer system, which is available in large quantities, it's an open system, and the respiratory and kidney system act on bicarb buffer system. And it is the most important buffer of extracellular fluids. The protein buffer system, the carboxyl or the amino groups of the proteins are the components of this buffer system. Maybe the biggest part of the buffers in the body has the protein buffer system, such as albumin and hemoglobin. The last one is the phosphate buffer system, which is love in the extracellular fluid but it's a major buffer system of the intracellular environment or intracellular fluid. Especially, it is, uh, the level of the phosphate buffer is significant in uh, muscle tissue. And also, it's a good buffer in kidney and bone. The deterioration of the acid-base balance in body fluids manifests itself with three main elements. And these are the pH value of the blood. Thus, we can say whether there is an acidemia or alkalemia. The partial pressure of the carbonic acid, which we, uh, which we evaluate the respiratory component of the system. And the blood concentration of Picard, which we evaluate the metabolic and as well as the kidney component of the system. So by evaluating these three elements we can diagnose or we, we can evaluate the acid base balance of an organism and the plasma pH is correlated with the carbonic acid bicarb ratio in this type in this table you see the buffer systems in the blood and their ratio and the bicarbonate component especially in plasma has the highest percentage and then also non bicarbonate component member look the hemoglobin is the leader. An ideal buffer should have the following characteristics. It should have a buffer capacity suitable for the desired pH limits. It should be very poor. It should be resistant to enzymatic and hydrolytic events. And the pH of the buffer should be minimally affected by the temperature, ion content, and concentration of the medium. It must be non-toxic and non-inhibitory. Mass enzymes, most enzymes are inhibited by phosphate buffers such as. Complexes with cations must be soluble. It should not absorb light in ultraviolet and visible range. And also buffer capacity, an equal molar mixture of a weak acid and its conjugated base has maximal buffer capacity and the buffer range of action is pH equals pK acid plus minus 1. The pH of a system depends on the ratio of the molar concentrations of acid and conjugated base. Therefore, deletion of the solution does not lead to a pH change. The pH value of the solution can be calculated by knowing the molar concentrations of the weak acid and the conjugated base. As the molar concentration of weak acid and conjugated base increase, the capacity of the buffer increases. And this is the end of our topic. It's time for references and uh, sources or literatures for further reading and the, uh, further studying. And both Turkish and English written books that I suggest you, including my website. And the next topic, as you guess, will be Bio Elements Part 1. And for the biochemistry, clinical biochemistry, and more about the laboratory world, 
you can visit my website and also you can subscribe to my instagram channel and don't forget to subscribe click on thumbs up and open notification for further news see you in our next topic goodbye